Welcome to Goldfish on Games, where today you're going to have to prove that you are a legitimate viewer by selecting the picture that shows up on page 15 of your subscription manual, or else you can't watch today's video on classic copy protection. These are going to be the off-disc style of protection, which meant you needed something extra to the game to prove you had a real copy. And these got really quite creative, as we'll see, as there were so many different ways to try and beat those filthy pirates. And one of the more popular ones was the Code Wheel, which had a few variations, but typically you had to try and line up something on the outer wheel to then be able to read the information from the inner one. Such as Zool 2. Which showed an image on the screen and then you had to try and recreate it on the wheel by moving the inner one. And once you've gotten it, you then had to try and find the right window on that wheel, which for Zool 2 meant trying to find one of 40 different windows. This would then give you a final number that you would then enter. And with this one, they've even gone to the extent of making the code wheel out of plastic to try and make it harder to copy. And on top of that, they made it difficult for you to be able to read the numbers, which is a trick we'll see again later. Now, other games, such as Cruise for a Corpse, had the windows in different sizes and required you to select the right images that showed up in the windows. This wouldn't be too bad if you happen to have a code wheel that perfectly lined up but as you can see, this one is slightly off center, so you have to sort of guess at what the images are going to be. Thankfully, most games will actually give you a few chances to get this right. Though some games would actually get you to enter a code correctly multiple times, just to make sure you didn't guess what it was the first time around. And because of those alignment issues, just photocopying and trying to make your own wheel wasn't always practical. As we saw with Zool 2, the materials made it much harder for you to copy, where Zool 1 was just cardboard and was much easier. Though there were some budget collections that would photo the wheel in each position and present you it in a codebook, which they must have decided was cheaper and easier than making new code wheels or removing the protection entirely. Now if you actually want to mess around with some code wheels, there's a website that has a number of them that you can actually interact with in your browser. I'll include the link in the description. So if having over a hundred different answers seemed like too small a number for you, then why not try using a whole book and have thousands of possible answers? Like K240, which had this chunky book. And at some point in the game, it'll give you a screen like this, and it'll ask you to type in the word based on the page, line number, and word count. Now, some games would break this up further with paragraphs, and it might also ask you to skip titles and headers, but others will ask you to include them. So you always have to pay attention to the instructions. And it always felt like if the box was heavy with manuals, then there was a good chance that this copy protection was going to be used. Much like with Frontier Elite 2 which actually had some legacy to live up to with its copy protection, as the original had the infamous lens lock protection, that thankfully never made it to the Amiga release. And while a book-based copy protection might seem like a nicer option, it couldn't be that straightforward, as it would ask you for the first letter of the word, which seems fair enough. And you might think you've entered it correctly, as the game will just continue. And it's not until later that the in-game police will go after you for failing the check. And worst of it all, your result of that password check is actually saved to the save game. So you will always be screwed over. It's a little bit evil to be honest, and not the best solution. Other games would also use the manual for its protection, but would drop the use of words, and instead just use the large number of pages to its advantage. Like Flashback, that would show you an image on the screen and a number. You would then have to hunt through the whole book trying to find that image and there are a lot of images in this book.
and when you find it, you need to enter the code that's across from the number that it provided. And with so many of the images being quite similar, it can take some time to find the right one. This game also had something that we used to joke about being an additional copy protection, and that is at the start of the second level, where you had to make this long jump. Now the basic controls that you can work out do not work here. Instead, you have to make this special jump, one that the manual will actually tell you about, but not something that you could easily stumble across. And this was something that I personally got stuck on for quite some time, until I bought the budget release and found out about that long jump in the manual. A variation on this type of copy protection is the trivia quiz. In that, it will ask you a question, and the only way you can answer it is by giving the right answers that you will find in the book. And if we check out June 2, it would ask for some information on a unit or building as part of the normal gameplay. And to better answer this, you'll have to look up the answer in the manual, which I think actually helps with the world building, as it's more information about the units and the buildings that you might not have known otherwise. I also quite like the fact that it's actually integrated into the game, as it's the Mentat asking you to answer the question. Even though I'm not entirely sure how correctly answering these questions about top secret information proves that you're not a spy. But it is quite cool that this game actually allows you to play a bit before it asks you to prove that you have a real copy. So in a way, if you didn't buy the game, you'd actually get a small demo instead. And of course, Wing Commander had to do something similar, but in a much cooler way, as the information you needed were on these amazing blueprint posters. Just look at these things, these are awesome. But really, it was just the same. Before you could get into the game, it would ask you to look up the answer to a question, which was some technical question on one of the crafts that you will fly or you would have to shoot down. And of course, that information was found on the blueprints. Now this one sort of straddles the line between being copy protection or being a feely, which was one way they tried to compete with pirates by giving you some extras that you'd get when you bought the game. This might be some extra information like the books in Frontier Elite 2, or its massive poster, It might be badges or stickers, which were also quite popular. But these were not strictly speaking copy protection. It was just a way of trying to give back to the people who actually bought the game. But it didn't stop those games also having an additional copy protection on top. As Turtles also had one of the more annoying copy protection methods, the hard to read code. Now this would typically be black text on dark brown paper. And the game would ask you to enter a code from a specific row and column. And if you're unlucky, you might have to look up multiple different pages, like the protection for worms, which is an entire booklet. Us Hero Turtles were also screwed a little bit further over the Ninja Turtles, as we got a much smaller book, with the exact same codes inside. Which meant you had to squint even more to work out what the code was, and as a further chance to try and mess with the gamer, if you wanted to cheat in this game, you needed to enter two specific codes on the copy protection screen, and then get that third one correct. So instead of getting the usual three attempts to get it right, you only got one. This also meant if you went with a cracked copy of the game, there was a good chance you couldn't cheat at all, unless they provided a trainer, who didn't always come along with the first cracks. There were a few variations on this hard to read copy protection, like Iridium 2, which did something similar to the Turtles, but instead it used light blue text on white paper. But Delphine Software really got creative with this style with Operation Stealth. Start the game and you'll get this image, which will flash a shape on the screen. You'll then need to look that up on this shiny reflective page with all the colours. And as you might imagine, as this is using colour, even if you manage to get a photocopier to make a copy of it, it wouldn't be all that useful. As even on the official release, it can be quite difficult to work out what the colour is, as there are a few of them that are very close to each other. And I have to admit, this is one that I used to fail at all the time. Alone in the Dark went with a slightly different approach, and that was to make this tiny little booklet. 
each page has two images and the game will ask you to pick the right two images from a page. It's actually quite charming to use, it's so small and tiny. But as you can imagine, after a few uses, the book does get a little bit tatty. And that was a problem with some of the other games, like Settlers. I've had this manual for decades, and just look at it, this thing has been through the wars. Because every single time I wanted to play this game, and I would play it a lot, I had to get this manual out. But there were alternatives to using paper, which would be all too easy to copy with the right technology, and that was using hardware. As shown by Cricket Captain of all games, as this included a hardware dongle. This had to be connected to the first port of the Amiga, and the game would actually check for its presence at multiple points while playing. Now, I assume that this is just sending a specific set of inputs to the port, and the game is reading those and validating them. Now, it might have some challenge response system built in, but I think that might have been a bit too advanced for a game. These have their own set of downsides, such as the fact that due to its design and size, these devices couldn't be used on all hardware, like the Amiga 600, as it had its joystick ports on the side and doesn't really give it enough space for it, or the Atari ST that had its ports underneath. Though it does just about fit on the CD32, so that shows that that was obviously the superior console even though it possibly was the only console in existence that actually had off-disc copy protection on a few games. That's right, imagine having to start up your game and then having to look at the manual just to be able to start it on a console. The biggest downside to any of these off-disc copy protections was that if you lost the booklet, the dongle, the copy protection sheet, then you were screwed. And this actually makes buying games secondhand a bit more of a challenge as I have gotten a few games that are missing the copy protection booklet. And if that happened back in the day, you might be able to get a second copy from the publisher, but it wasn't always guaranteed. So really, your only other option was to try and find a pre-cracked version of the game, as it was much easier to find cracked copies of the games than standalone cracks themselves, if there even was one. And there we have a quick selection of the more interesting ones that I happen to own. And did you have a favourite? Or was there one that you hated with the fire of a thousand suns? Let me know down in the comments. And until next time, I was the Gouldfish. That was Error Protection Checked Failed. And this was Gouldfish on Games. Thank you for watching my video. I do hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, you can let me know down in the comments, or you can use those buttons just below. You know the ones I mean. Or if you're not sure yet, then you can check out two other videos that I've done that are on the screen right now. So thank you again, and I hope to see you soon.